Well, good morning, everyone. So good to have each of you here today. And um, are you glad to be here today? We're glad you're here. And I know the kids are excited. I just poked my head in there and looked at all of them. I said, I can't wait to hear you sing. And, and they, they look excited. So uh, just I think they're going to have a good time ministering to you. And we're going to have a great time listening to them share and sing. And so let's have a word of prayer and dedicate everything to the Lord. Father, we love you and we praise you and thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the church family. I thank you for our guests that have joined us today, those that are watching online this morning. I pray, dear Holy Spirit, that you'd have freedom and to work and minister through the children today and as well as through the preaching of God's word. We love you and thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. Hey, why don't we all stand together, stretch, and we're going to, you can greet someone real quick as the musicians are warming up, and we'll sing some Christmas songs in a minute. Grace Church. Wow. We got extra people here and everything else, and you guys are still quiet. Good morning, Grace Church. I know I have way too much energy. That's okay. We're going to ask you to join us in yet another familiar song, all right? Oh, come. Oh, God. 
again, we just want to thank you so much for this day that you've given us to come together and worship you. Thank you for letting us sing praises to you, Lord. I pray that you be with, with the message today, Lord. May, may the speaker's words be your words. Um, we just thank you for all you give us, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the kids are going to come do their program now, so please enjoy.
What did Jesus mean to be angels? Is coming like good news or great joy to all the people? Or is he saying that the word on the streets would be loving and joyful to Jesus? So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who were lying in the room. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. What did Jesus do to the shepherds? He meant hope for all mankind that he would come to us and humble himself. Because you like that. Shepherd! 
Let's go ahead and stand. Stand and applaud. Kids, great job. Thank you so much. I want to thank Pastor Brian. I want to thank Cheryl. And I think Jeannie Rithmeyer also was helping, plus our tech team, uh, all the hard work you all did in, in practice and planning and all that. Thank you very much. You all may be seated. I want to give you one last chance to stretch. And uh, before Brother Rich 
uh, our missionary from Germany comes, and he usually speaks for two hours, so I want to make sure that you had a good chance to stretch before you came. I got a couple quick announcements before we, as we're getting the pulpit, I'm in a way here, as we get the pulpit put back up here. Um, there is uh, candles and carols and communion uh, service this Friday night, uh, December 24th at 7 p.m. And if you want to come on out, you're welcome to bring your family and we'll just have a time of worship and devotion and, and observe the Lord's Supper. And afterwards, we'll have some cookies and refreshments for everybody that would like to stay afterwards for some fellowship. Christmas service on next Sunday, December 26. Uh, I do want to mention that um, on Wednesday night, the teenagers are meeting here at the church uh, for pajamas and pancake uh, fellowship here. And uh, so, anyway, they're going to have a great time. So if you're junior high, senior high, you're all welcome and hope that you'll come out for that. And uh, we have a prayer gathering Saturday, January 15th. I mention it now because it goes from 9 a.m. to 1 Pastor Rob from Fellowship Community in Norwalk and, and Pastor Matt are going to be with us and leading us in prayer and, and worship and just have a great time together. Good way to kind of get the year kicked off on the right uh, foot here. So hope you can join us for that. You can sign up at the information table to be a part of that. And then I want to give you an update on our mission offering that we've been taking through the month of December. So far we're at $20,786, which is phenomenal. Can we give the Lord a hand and praise Him for that? That is awesome. Total awesome, and this this money doesn't stay here. It goes to missionaries all over the world that are serving the Lord in various capacities. And so, uh, thank you for your generosity and for your service uh, to the Lord in giving. And uh, I'm going to ask Brother Rich. It's been about six years since Rich has been here. I'll let him kind of share about his ministry and his family. And uh, so, let's welcome Brother Rich here this morning. God bless you, Rich. Well, it is good to be back with you guys. Um, I was here last time in 2016, and last summer we tried to come, but there was a lot of stuff going on with Corona that hindered us from coming, so it's just the, the world in which we live in, so um, it's good to be again here with you. When I was here last time, we had two children, and um, now we have three kids. Um, my, our oldest is nine, and then our next is six, Justice Lincoln and Lucy, she is four. They're supposed to be with us today, but in the world we live in as well, they all got sick, so coughing and sneezing and mucus, so I thought, eh, probably better not to bring the, the, the hospital with us today, so anyway, it's great to be with you guys, it's hard to follow that as well, the children, so if you're like, man, I was just here for the kids, I don't know what this guy's doing right now, I'm sorry about that, but bear with me, and uh, I want to share with you guys a little bit about Germany before we get into our text today, kind of what God has been doing the last eight years, we've been almost there nine years in Germany. And uh, last time I was here, much has happened. Um, so we are, the Rudolphs, we are church planning in Germany. And again, you're looking, you're like, yes, bread, sausage, the Autobahn, and chocolate. That's what we're known for. So before we begin sharing about Germany, I'm going to do a little quiz with you guys about Germany, see how well you do. All right, what are the colors of Germany's flag? Is it, if you think it's A, red, white, and blue, raise your hand. That's good. B, green, yellow, and red. Or C, black, red, and yellow? If you said C, you are correct. Give yourself a point. All right, next question. How many different types of bread are there in Germany? Is it A, 15? If you think 15, raise your hand. If you think B, 300? If you think C, 67? If you said B, you are correct. There are over 300 types of bread in Germany. So when you go to the bakery, they're very regional as well, so you might find one in one region, not another region. Uh, every bakery has their own little blend, and it's a great place when you compare bread from Germany to here. It's completely different, much better, I would say, in Germany. Our kids love the bread here. They're like, what is this stuff here? I'm like, they call it bread. I'm sorry. <laughs> Next question. How many different types of sausages uh, does Germany have? Is it A, 50? If you think 50, raise your hand. Okay. B, 500? C, 1,000? Wow, some people really thought 1,000. If you did think 1,000, you're correct. The worst type of sausage, or one of the interesting types of sausage, is called blood sausage. And that's literally like fresh blood in the sausage that's been hardened and it's black. It's like completely black. It's very salty. Um, I have eaten it before. Uh, so if you ever go to Germany, you can say, I want some blood sausage, Blutwurst. 
All right, next one. What continent is Germany on? I really hope everyone gets this right. If not, <laughs> is it A, Asia? Phew. B, Africa? Good. C, Europe? Okay, phew, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then the last question, I think. What is Germany famous for? Is it A, bread, chocolate, and cars? Is it sun, palm trees, and warm weather? Or C, uncomfortable beds? It's A, bread, chocolate, and cars. I like their beds. And definitely not palm trees. Uh, how many states does Germany have? A, 50, like America? We do have 50 states, okay. B, 16? C, 37? B, 16. There's only 16 states, and we live in the state of Czarland. Next question. How many people claim to have a relationship with Jesus Christ in the country of Germany? Is it A, 50? B, 35? Or C, less than 2? Who thinks? C? If you said C, you are correct. It is less than 2% would claim a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can go to the next question. That's us then. Okay, good. Yeah, C. That leads me into kind of the reason why we went to Germany in the first place. Uh, less than 2% of people claim a relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, my family, we began church planning almost nine years ago in a state called Zarland, which is one of the most unreached states in all of Germany. Uh, it's right in the corner next to France. Um, there hasn't been real, really much any great awakenings or Christian activity or reformation that happened there. Uh, it's a very dead area to the gospel. There's one million people in our state. And from my calculations of how many churches and people, like maybe 300 people would claim, to 500 people claim a relationship with Jesus Christ, which fits the statistic as well in our whole state. But probably closer to 300 people. And so when we went there, it was a very hard place to go. And it was very, uh, we, we started with just a couple people. And by God's grace, we saw so many things happen uh, that I want to celebrate with you today because when we celebrate what, what even Christmas, we celebrate what the birth of Christ means, and it means the opportunity for salvation. It means the opportunity that God works in unexpected ways, and he works with unexpected or people that are unexpectedly coming to Christ. The, most, the people who are most unreached, the people that would unexpectedly find Christ are being reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the last eight years, we've seen uh, 20 people baptized in our church and uh, more people coming to faith. And so um, that is attributed to you uh, in your prayers as well. As Paul says that, you know, you pray that I have an opportunity to share the gospel. And you guys have joined us in that prayer for outreach. And um, the ways that we've seen God do a great work is through the outreaches we've had. Um, you see there... Uh, we have teen outreaches where we are able to have missions trips come over and people come. Uh, the outreach right there, if you see that bottom left, that's a choir outreach that we used to do yearly. We haven't been able to lately because of corona. But um, we would see through a whole week of ministry, a thousand people come and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's amazing. And God worked in extraordinary ways during those outreaches and these kids outreaches we would have. We would also do men's and women's ministries and quarterly trainings that we were doing. Um, it's amazing to see how God worked in unexpected ways in our women's Bible study. My wife would start women's Bible studies and see these women who would have little to no uh, uh, gospel understanding and see them just dive deep into the Word of God and dive deep into understanding how to read their Bible. And Julie would walk through these Bible study principles with these women and and uh, just an unexpected ways how God would connect her with these women. Uh, the, the woman up there on the far right is one of Julia's good friends who is a religion teacher at our community college in that area. And through a missions trip that we had into that uh, college, we were able to go in there and share Christ. We got connected with her, and her and Julia also became friends. And through that, it's unbelievable to see how Julia's been able to connect with her and do Bible study and just see the gospel transform her life. Our men's ministry is such an amazing opportunity to see guys coming and, and getting to know one another and, and just really having community, which I've seen that you guys have been able to do here is amazing community. And then our quarterly trainings, we have quarterly trainings where God is working and doing great stuff where we are getting together for um, church planning activities. And then just amazing things like I wanted to say is 
salvations, baptism, and church leadership, one of the things when we go over there is we want we wanted to establish leaders to lead our church. We don't want to stay there our whole life because a missionary goes and you plant a church and you raise up leaders so that they come to know Christ and after knowing the gospel, knowing the word of God, that they're able to lead the church and fulfill those qualifications of elders. And so um, after seeing so many people come to Christ in the church growing, we really made an effort to invest into our leaders and to see God work in their life. And when we left in June, we really handed the ministry over to them and said, okay, uh, this is your ministry now. This is uh, what we've been aiming for and pushing for. It doesn't mean that we're not going to be a part of that still as a missionary as Paul was when he left other churches. He still had the connection and coached them and loved them and mentored them. And um, that's what our aim is, and that was our leadership team uh, when we left there. And uh, it was unbelievable to see how God, even this year, through the midst of COVID and regulations, that God worked in unexpected ways. We saw three people baptized this year. I'm just going to share a quick story with the girl up there in that top left corner, how God works unexpectedly. Um, We have had and suffered a lot through COVID and restrictions in our area. If you read the news or anything in Europe, there's a lot of heavy lockdowns. Um, And so we had to move into this old, old church building that wasn't being used on Sundays because it was the only building big enough that we could fulfill the government requirements. We were in there for 18 months. It was cold. We couldn't have heat on in there. It was just not great. But this girl who lived across the street, unexpectedly, the most unexpected person you would imagine, came to church one Sunday and said, I'd like to know more about God. Is this where I should come? Yeah, this is where you should come, right? We were so excited as she walked in there. Normally, uh, was uh, on Saturdays was a Catholic church meeting in there, but we were able to meet there Sundays, and so I was so excited that she came Sunday morning and she saw some activity in that church. And so she came, and she lived just a couple doors down from our family, and right away we said, like, we would love to invite you over, and we would love to do a Bible study with you. And so through months of doing Bible study and her family was very skeptical. I mean, her dad came to our house actually a year ago to, today and uh, just kind of knocked on our door and said, are you guys a cult? Are you a, you know, a sect? Like, what are you doing to my daughter? You know, no, we, we are Christians. He's like, you're Christians. Are you sure? Yes, we are. Because in our area, if you're not Catholic, you're not considered a Christian. So we uh, explained to him who we are and what we believe. And we're just going through Bible study with her and uh, had them over as well, the family, get to know them. And she, through the means of Bible study with my wife, myself, she came to Christ. And I looked and we, we said this as a church, we were displaced and we've gone through hardships, but if it meant that one person came to Christ during all that and she just got baptized in October, was it worth it? Was it worth the uncomfort and the, the hardships that we experienced? And I would say, yeah that they rejoice in heaven that one person came to Christ through the midst of that in our city. And I say that because God works in so many unexpected ways with people you don't expect that would come to Christ. She came from a Muslim background, and her family were refugees out of Iran. And through the most unexpected means of her coming to Germany, God reached the most unexpected person. If you were to say, who would come to Christ? It wouldn't be that family. It wouldn't be her. And that's how God works. And that's how God has saved so many people in our ministry and how God has worked in so many amazing ways. And we praise God for that. Every story is a story of, wow, God, you worked amazingly. And uh, we attribute that to your prayers and attribute that to what, what God is just doing through the Holy Spirit there. And so I just want to share with you here at the end a little bit about Germany. You can go to the next slide, I think. How to pray for us right now. Um, it really, if you could pray, just pray that this way for us. The corona situation in our country has really rocked, I mean, rocked our church. And I know we've experienced it everywhere, but we have extreme situations there that I I don't want to get into it because I don't want to give that whole situation any more talking than I need to, but just pray for us because it has really split churches and it's split our church recently and it's hard and it's discouraging But at the same time, we have to remember that even through the darkest of hardship of situations that the gospel is still light and that our leadership team would not be discouraged during this time. I mean, they are discouraged. They are down. Um, I feel like every week there's something new coming up. 
especially in these last two months. Just pray for them that they would not give up and that they would continue to run the race because it's hard. And it's many, many days that they just question. Third, like I said, not to lose focus on the mission. The mission is not who's right and who's wrong for a topic that no one knows enough about. And we shouldn't be giving as much attention to it. But the focus is making disciples. And our church has really lost that focus in Germany at times of making disciples. And we're trying to remember we exist to glorify God and make disciples in Song Bendel. And if we forget that, then why are we here? So pray that we would refocus in 2022 on that mission that we have. And then just the encouragement for our whole network through this time. We have a network of six churches that we work with, and all of our churches are struggling but one. One has really grown during this time, praise the Lord. All the rest are just being beaten down by all this stuff. And you can just pray for them because it's easy for me to be here right now. I, we don't have the restrictions that they have. And just for them trying to navigate through that and having conversations. So just pray the encouragement for those churches that churches wouldn't close down, that they wouldn't disband. We've already had one that's loosely affiliated with our network that disbanded this last month. And just to remind them that the mission stays the same and that we can try to find unity in the spirit. And if we seek the spirit, we find unity. We seek the mission of glorifying God, we'll find unity. And just pray for that for them. And so that's the ways you could be praying for our ministry over there. Um, if you would like to join our prayer letter, we send out a prayer letter every two months. Um, my, my name is Richard Rudolph. Uh, I had cards that somehow got displaced. I don't know where they are, but that's not going to blame anyone in my family. It's probably my fault. RichardRudolph at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to email me, I will add you to that list. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. And you can ask me again after the service for my name if you want that. So that's the best way to keep in contact with what God is doing over in Germany. God is always working unexpectedly in ways you can't imagine with people you don't think will ever come to Christ. And maybe that's you today. Maybe you are the person that you thought, I want nothing to do with God. Maybe you're here just for that children's program today. Maybe you're here because the church has great donuts. And you're like, uh, I'm not looking for God. I'm not looking for any of these things. I'm the person that would least come to Christ. And that's what I want to kind of talk about today. If you have your Bibles, go to Matthew 2. I want you to go to Matthew 2 and feeding off of what we just experienced at this Christmas play. I love Christmas plays and I love children's Christmas plays because something always goes awry. This one didn't. This was great. But I love it like when the microphones fall down and something goes just haywire or some kid, you know, is like, I don't want to be here and runs off stage like, oh boy. But every child is given a role in a Christmas play. I've been in Christmas plays and I've had my roles and I'm sure maybe you have growing up in church if you did grow up in church. And everybody plays a role and you have a job to do or you fulfill a role of what you're supposed to do. And when we read the Christmas story and we go through this, there are people who are kind of like the good people. Like, wow, this is an amazing person. And then we have roles in the Christmas story of people that are like, this is a bad person, Herod. And then we have the main person, Jesus. And so in all these Christmas stories, when we go through the birth of Christ, we see the different roles being played, and you saw them dressed up here today, those different roles that were being played. And you know what's amazing is that I think we can identify with different people in the Christmas story in our own life. I think each and every one of us can identify with one of these people today. Obviously not, not Jesus, even though maybe you think, well, I am pretty good. No, you can't identify with Jesus. He loves you and he came and died for you. But today I want to look at three people in the story here in Matthew 2. And how each of them reacted differently to the news of Jesus. And today I want to ask you and ask myself, ask ourselves today this question. Who do I identify with in the Christmas story? Write that question down. Today I want to ask ourselves this question. Who do I identify with in the Christmas story? Okay, I'm going to read for us Matthew 2, 1 through 10 and then kind of skip down to verse 16. It says this, 
Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and asked them from what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen, when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Go to verse 16. Verses 11 through 15 is where we see that they give Jesus these wonderful gifts, and we see the flight to Egypt there where Jesus goes. And then in verse 16 it says this, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old and under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because there are no more. There are three characters that we need to look at. And when each of them hear the story of Jesus in Matthew 2, they each respond differently. The first person is Herod. The second are the scribes. And the third are the wise men. The first, let's look at Herod, his role in the Christmas story, and I want you to see, do I identify with Herod? And right away you're like, I hope not. I hope I don't identify with him, but let's read this, okay? Herod's background and who he was, he's a very important person to understand, even in the story of Jesus. See, Herod became king over this area with the help of Rome. Rome always had trouble in in Israel and there, and rebellions, so Herod said to the Romans, if you help me become king, uh, they will, I will help you and make sure that they obey you and help Rome, really serve under Rome, but if you let me just kind of rule this area, I'll be king of it, and we'll make sure that there's no like big uprisings and things like that. And Herod, in return, he did great things. He built the temple. He did these things for the Jews so that they could, quote unquote, worship Yahweh the way they wanted to, as long as they served Rome still, and kind of were under his rule. And the Romans granted this wish of Herod. And they even gave Herod this name, the King of the Jews. And he liked that name. Have you ever heard that before, King of the Jews? The story of Jesus? Well, Herod took that name, King of the Jews. We know that from history. And he wanted to have that title and to be their king. He was not Jewish by birth, but his father converted to Judaism. So Herod grew up learning about Judaism, and he knew a little bit, you know, as a person from a Jewish descent would know. And he knew from the Old Testament that this Messiah would come, but he tried to put himself in that part, king of the Jews. And he was going to be king of the Jews, therefore that's why he did all those things for them, to show that he was the king of the Jews. He rebuilt the temple, but in all actuality, Herod only cared about his own life. Herod only cared about his own kingdom and what he did for himself. The God of the Bible, the Old Testament, Yahweh, played no real role in Herod's life. Although, when you think about, when you look at him, you're like, well, he did rebuild the temple. No. That had nothing to do with Yahweh, that had everything to do with Herod. He used the idea of God or religion to get what he wanted. God was not real to him, Yahweh of the Bible, but only a means to an end. 
a way for him to get farther in his pursuit of his own kingdom. God had no real focus in his life. Only Herod's kingdom mattered to Herod. So then when the wise men come and they ask him, where can we find king, the king of the Jews? Herod probably thought, well, you're speaking to him. I'm here. And they said, we saw his star. He has just been birthed. Where could we find him? We heard that he was recently born. We want to go worship him and adore him. This disturbed Herod, it says, and all of Jerusalem with it. Herod was obviously angry. He was tricky. He was lying. He was trying to trick the wise men. And we know he was angry. Why? Because Herod, in the end, kills innocent babies. When Herod found out this troubled him, why would this trouble him? Because this real king of the Jews who was born threatened Herod and his kingdom. It threatened everything that he wanted to obtain for himself if the real king of the Jews came, and he couldn't have that. The real king, Jesus, threatens Herod's kingdom. And it makes Herod realize that he's a phony king and on a phony throne, and his kingdom is fake, worth nothing. It's as if, have you ever gone to a child's birthday party? There's a child there who's having the birthday party. But I see that with my own kids. They have a problem sometimes when it's not their birthday party. They're not the focus. So sometimes at kids' birthday parties, what happens? They're like, well, where are my presents? What? I thought it was about me. No, this is your brother's birthday party. Well, that's not fair. The focus is about him, and we're giving him birthday presents, but what happens? This other child tries to steal the spotlight and cry and whine, and I want my presents too. Well, your birthday is another month. It's not about you. It's not about what you want. And so they cry and they try to steal all the attention onto them because they can't handle that somebody else has a birthday party and they're not the center. I always enjoy seeing that at kids' birthday parties. So a kid's crying in the corner because he wants that toy too. He wants the cake. He wants to blow out the candles. He wants everything to be about them. But you know what's interesting? That's Herod. And that's a lot of us. Christmas, the birth of Jesus, the kingdom of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the cross of Jesus has everything to do about Jesus and his kingdom and what he is doing and the gospel and what he's trying to do. But most of the time, that threatens our life. When we hear that, if we identify with Herod, we hear that and we are trying to set up our kingdom and our throne and if we can use God a little bit on the side as long as we get what we want and we can stay in the center of our own stories instead of putting Jesus on the throne and keeping ourselves on the throne, everything's okay. But as soon as Jesus comes and we're faced with the reality of who Jesus is where he says, there's only one king, there's only one savior, you have to be dethroned, you have to sit and I am in the middle and focus of your life, what do we do sometimes when we threaten by that? We want to kill Jesus. We're too threatened and we don't want anything to do with Jesus. We'll, we're okay with Jesus as long as I can stay in the center, just like Herod. But as soon as that is threatened, what do we do? I don't want anything of Jesus. And maybe that's how you are. Maybe you identify that. Maybe you have been rebelling against Jesus for a long, long time and you've wanted nothing to do with him and you fight against him, you fight against him, you fight against him. And he's saying, I need to be Lord of your life. It's not about you, it's about me. Surrender your life. And you're just like that little kid at the birthday party crying because you're like, it has to be about me. He's like, no, it's about me. Can you identify with that? That's who Herod was. Have you accepted Jesus as king and submitted to him? and put him in the right place in your life. <clears throat> the second role in the Christmas story is this, the scribes. The scribes were men who studied the Old Testament. They discussed the meanings of Scripture all the time, and they had so much knowledge of the Bible, and guess what? They were waiting for the true Messiah. This is the highlight of Judaism. The Messiah to come. And so here comes wise men, and they come and they said, we are here to worship 
the king of the Jews, and these scribes get together, and Herod says, where is he supposed to be? Well, the scribes say, Bethlehem. This is the highlight of their whole life. They know where to find him. They know where to go. And what do they do? Nothing. The people who know the most, the people who have the most knowledge, and really, this is the high point of their life. When they hear that born today is king of the Jews, let us go worship them. What do they do with the knowledge of what they just heard, even though they know so much? Nothing. They sit and are lukewarm, they're passive, they're unmoved, and they stay. That's crazy. That's the craziest thing I have ever heard. If you were waiting for something your whole life and you did nothing with it. It'd be like this. Let's say you had a very, very rich, distant relative. And you knew, I'm the only relative, and this guy's a multi-billionaire. And you knew that someday, you've heard rumors that someday you would get this money. Well, you get the letter in the mail, and it says, your uncle Steve has passed away, and he's left you everything. The only thing you have to do is what? Go actively and find the treasure. You've got to get up, and you've got to go find it, and here's the coordinates, and you've got to be active to go get it. What would you do? Would you be passive, knowing that there were billions of dollars waiting for you? Would you be lukewarm? Would you be unmoved? I'll tell you one thing. I'd sell everything, stop what I was doing, find a flight, do whatever it took to go get that money. Why? Because we value money. We value that thing. We're like, I want it because I know the value of it, and I need it. But when it comes to Jesus, and in this story, they hear about the thing they've been waiting for, the greatest news that's worth better, more than $1 billion, and they don't move. They're lukewarm. They're passive. Maybe you identify with them. You know a lot about the Bible. You come to church every Sunday. You can tell the story of Jesus from Luke 2 and Matthew 2, and you know it all. You can maybe even recite the lineage. That would be impressive. But when it comes to the real news of Jesus, you are passive and lukewarm, and he doesn't move you anymore. The knowledge that born to us in the city of David is a Savior that doesn't move your heart anymore, and you're still there, and you're lukewarm in your walk with Christ, and you're not taking the steps necessary, and you don't have passion anymore. And you don't care anymore. You're like, yeah, that's great. He's born. Yeah, that's great. I know that he died on the cross for my sins. But the story of Jesus is not moving anymore. And you're just lukewarm. Can you identify with that? There's times in my life where I identify with the scribes. Sit there and, yeah, that's great, Jesus, Savior of the world. And I'm not moved as if what's waiting for me is greater than a billion dollars. Instead, I sit lukewarm, unchanged, yet I have a bunch of Bible knowledge. If that's you today, let the story of Jesus awaken your heart again to realize what Savior means. That you were once lost in your transgressions, and He came, and He died for you, and He wants a relationship with you, and He has a relationship with you, and He's saying, come and serve me, follow me passionately, 100%, no matter what it costs. And let's turn and let's reach Newton for Jesus Christ. Imagine if there were 500 people, 200 people that are passionately on fire for Jesus Christ. They wouldn't be like the scribes sitting there. They'd be like the next person. They'd be like the next person. So do you identify with the scribes? This third person, though, is the unexpected. The third role are the wise men. The most unexpected person in the Christmas story are the wise men. They don't come from the Jewish tradition. They don't come with, they aren't the scribes, the Pharisees. They don't have all the information. They don't know where the baby will be born. But they're coming. And they're interested. They've got to know more. And they're passionately seeking him. It's amazing. We don't know much about these wise men. We don't know how many there were. 
We know that they come from the east, so probably Babylon, Persia. We believe, the theologians believe, that they had enough information about this king of the Jews that would come from the book of Daniel, from Old Testament writings. Even after the exile, a group of Jews stayed over in Babylon and Persia. So there's this idea that they had enough information to know what they should be expecting and waiting for. And God gets their attention in the star, and he's saying, now's the time, I'm here. And these men who studied the skies, we know that that from their background, they studied different things. They were waiting. They saw this. They had just enough information that they go. Nothing's going to stop them. We don't know how long they traveled for, but they came. And they passionately sought and wanted to pursue because they said, we want to worship the king of the Jews. But it was those who were least expected to be worshiping king of the Jews that came. And what did they do? They came and worshipped him. And they bowed down and they gave him gifts. Expensive gifts. And it didn't matter how long they traveled. It didn't matter how long it took. But this king of the Jews would change their life forever. The unexpected person in the story. Out of all the three people in the story, the wise men are the ones who reacted correctly the wise men although they were the most unusual person in this whole christmas story they are the ones who respond correctly and that's to worship the king passionately they're identified as worshipers do you identify with them today are you a worshiper of jesus christ are you passionately pursuing christ that you were like the wise men that says, I don't care what it takes, I don't care what mountains i got to climb, but I'm going to come and I'm going to give Jesus my best in everything I have because he's worth it all. And I want to worship him. I want to fall on my knees and say, here I am, use my life any way you want. And I love this story because just like the people I've seen come to Christ in Germany, the most unexpected people that came to worship Jesus, is the same in this story, and it's the same here. Maybe you're here today and you're like, Rich, I've got a terrible background. I know nothing about God. I'm here for this Christmas play. I'm here for a a random moment. You're exactly the person that Christ wants to reach. You're exactly the person that Christ came on this earth 2,000 years ago to die for. The unexpected, the lowly, the far away. And he's coming, and he came, and he said, I want you. I want to be your savior i want to have a relationship with you and the only thing you have to do is come to me ask for forgiveness realize that i am the king that needs to be on the throne of your life and realize that i'm the only way for truth and salvation have your sins forgiven and to have eternal life with me that's why jesus died then years later on a cross bloodied and martyred to pay for the penalty of our sin and that's the good news of christmas that a savior would come and die for us and so if you're here today jesus wants you he loves you that's why he came and you might think i'm the most unlikely person to accept this message then you're the perfect person who needs this just like i was many years ago person far away lost my sins and when i realized how great his love was for me that he would come and then die and take my sin. That's who he wants, to be a worshiper. So today, after seeing the three roles of Christmas, who do you identify with? Herod, who wants to kill Jesus, not let him on the throne, and wants to live his own kingdom? Is that you today? Maybe second, the scribes, people who know a lot, but are lukewarm, passive, and are not moved by the story. Or maybe the third, the person like the wise men, who is seeking and pursuing and wants to be a worshiper no matter what it takes. I'll tell you one thing. If a church has 200 worshipers of Christ, it'll turn a city upside down. It'll turn a city upside down. And that's what happens in the story of Jesus, that those who are worshipers and went out and told more, it turned the world upside down. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to come And to just share what you've done in Germany, Lord. We thank you that you work with many unexpected ways, with unexpected people. And Jesus, we glorify you in that. It's all about you. It's what you have done. 
Lord, and even in the story, how you called these wise men to you in a very unexpected way, Jesus. And I pray if there's somebody here today that doesn't know you, that's not following you, Lord, or maybe those who are passive or will not give you the throne of their life, Lord, I pray that they would see the love of Jesus, that you would come and die for us today and become that Savior. I pray for this church. I thank you for this church and their kind and generous prayers and offerings to us, Lord. Bless them. Amen. May I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes for a minute and before we dismiss, and just if you're here this morning and you'd like to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I think that one song the children sang, um, Don't Leave Jesus Out of Christmas. And if you have never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but today you would like to make sure that you know him, that you're ready to meet him one day, you want to know for sure that heaven will be your home. Maybe today you'd like to invite Christ in your life. He died for your sins, paid for all of them with his blood, rose again that third day. And right now, by faith in Jesus, he can save you. So if there's anyone to say, Pastor Dan, would you pray for me? I'd like to invite Jesus to be my Lord and Savior this morning. You just lift your hand if that's you. No one's going to come back to you or call you out. But if, if you're here this morning and you'd like to invite Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you lift your hand up? We'll pray for you. Good to hear it all. If you'd like to let him into your life, maybe you're nervous about raising your hand, that's fine. If you're watching online, you would like to invite Christ into your life. And would you pray this prayer with me and mean it in your heart and by faith trust Jesus to save you? Let's pray, dear Heavenly Father. I know I'm a sinner, and I know because of my sins that I deserve hell. But I believe that Jesus died on that cross for me over 2,000 years ago. I believe that. And I believe that he paid for my sins with his precious blood, and that he arose again on that third day. And I believe that. And I ask you, Jesus, to forgive my sins. I turn to you in faith, believing only you can save me. And on this day, I give you the care and the control of my life. Please save me. And in Jesus' precious name. Father, I thank you for this group here today. I pray your blessings and continued work in each of our life. And I pray, Lord, that, that we wouldn't be like a Herod or be like the scribes and different to the Lord. But God, we be like the wise men, passionate in love for the Lord, wanting to worship Him and serve Him. I pray that would be our life. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Hey, if I don't see you before Christmas, I want to wish each of you a Merry Christmas. And I hope that you have a blessed New Year. Uh, I would ask prayer for our family. We're leaving to go to Minnesota uh, my brother's granddaughter, Mary Hayton, age seven, passed away in her sleep, and we're going to a funeral tomorrow at 11 o'clock. I'm asking for prayer in particular because I know there'll be people there that don't know the Lord, and so I'm asking prayer that, that God not only would comfort the family, but that uh, he would work in hearts and bring people into the family of God. Amen? And so if you would pray. Uh, it's at 11 o'clock tomorrow up in Minnesota. Appreciate your prayers. And uh, parents and grandparents, thank you for coming today uh, to listen to the children minister and worship. Wasn't a blessing to see them. I was watching little Madeline. She was having a great time up here um, going through the motions and, and singing. And, and all the little ones were just having a good time worshiping Christ. So what a blessing. What a blessing to see you. You have a great day. And God bless you. We're going to let you go. You have a good day.